Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. When we first started this show, my goal was to talk to world-class operators who had been there, done that, so that we as an audience could learn from their experiences. Now, experiences and the stories that our guests have told are great, but we're operators, so I should have realized that numbers, proven approaches that yield tangible, measurable results, that's what operators really want. Luckily for us, that's exactly what our guest today brings. That guest is Jeremy Donovan, Executive Vice President of RevOps and Strategy for Insight Partners, a venture capital firm that specializes in scaling companies. If you've ever come across a LinkedIn post that starts with, hey, salespeople, you've come across Jeremy. Prior to his role at Insight Partners, Jeremy led revenue strategy and a variety of leadership roles at SalesLoft, CB Insights, and he spent 16 years at Gartner. With all of his experience, Jeremy is well positioned to help us bring data to the conversation of what good looks like and ultimately separate the practices from the best practices. So that's exactly what we're going to do. In our conversation, Jeremy explains the methodology he used to create what he calls the revenue maturity assessment across 122 different companies. We talk about why some best practices make you a top performer and others don't, and why of all things, Jeremy's chosen to be a student of CROs. To start though, I asked him about his new role at Insight Partners and how he decided to approach distilling these best practices in the first place. When I was listening for the most part to your podcast, and I continue to listen now, I was at SalesLoft, and you know there we had over a billion interactions between companies and their own prospects and their own customers, so that we could figure out what were the things that people might write in an email that would be correlated, right? It's correlation, not causation, would be correlated with success. So I could test anything, right? I could test hi, hey, hello, and the and the salutation. I could test you know, hope things are well, I could test all these things in, in emails and figure out whether they were correlated with success. I moved over from SalesLoft to Insight Partners back in January of this year of 2022. And I felt, okay, we've got some awesome benchmarking data. We've got killer stuff around sales KPIs. We've got killer stuff around CS. We've got killer stuff around um, uh, compensation and quota and so forth, right? So we had all this great stuff. But I was I was really looking for something that was actionable, not just for sales leadership, but also for sales managers and, and salespeople. And the the thing I set out to do was, okay, I read a ton. I listen to podcasts uh, almost addictively. And <laughs> I hear there's all these things that people say, here's a practice. You know, you should do this, you should do that. And if you were, and it's just impossible to do everything. So how do you piece through that to find out the handful of things that the handful of I, I refer to them as practices that are best practice, and what I what I did was I you know cold through all you know your podcast, other people's podcast, books, and so forth, and just tried to figure out what are the things that people recommend across nine categories. Right, go to market strategy, sales comp, hiring, sales process. Right, I won't list all nine, but people are welcome to kind of reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to share the full the full thing here. Um, and I, I've found 59 different practices, and I'm sure there are more, but you know, whatever. I, a survey needs to not be super complex, so I found 59 different practices, and I sent those. Uh, uh, this I created this thing called a revenue maturity assessment. I sent it out to 122 companies, and I just asked people to, you know, say where they were on the maturity spectrum for each one of those practices. But then, just knowing what people are doing is simply benchmark. Right, benchmark is average, and benchmark is not necessarily best practice. So I then I, I added, I included a question in the in the survey, and um, the question I had, I had to have some kind of measure of performance. So I asked, "How has your company performed relative to your closest competitor over the last twelve months?" And they would say, "Whatever, much better, somewhat better, about the same, what have you." And I know because I read a lot of academic research, and I used to work in the uh, briefly, but always been been interested in human professional learning, and selfishly and selflessly, <laughs> and I, I know from that literature that people are actually incredibly effective at self assessment. Mm. Um, they do lie a little bit, right? Like they'll lie by I'll call it one shade of gray. Mm. 
So, you know, if they performed about the same, they might say somewhat better, right? So they lie by one shade of gray, but they tend to not lie by two shades of gray. And they also tend not to lie at the extremes. So they're not going to say they're much better when they're not. Um, so we took the people who said they were much better on that relative to their competitors in the last 12 months and compared them to whether they and compared them to a grouping of much worse, somewhat worse, or about the same. We skipped somewhat better because like that's that that is a fuzzy zone, you know, to me. It's like net promoter score, right? I think you take the the nines and tens yeah. and you subtract the zeros through sixes, but you ignore the sevens and eights. So somewhat better is kind of like a seven or an eight on a on a net promoter score. Um I, I will say when I shared that with a few people, especially internally, and I work with people who you know, are as quant as I am. And they said, ah, I don't know about that. It's not good enough for me. So, so we did a little extra work where a, a lot of these companies were companies that were inside the Insight portfolio. So we actually knew their performance. Mm. And we looked at those who called themselves top performers relative to the ones who did not. And it turned out that on pretty much every measure that at every key measure, those who did rate themselves top performers were in fact twice as good on a bunch of SaaS metrics. So for instance, enterprise value growth or ARR year over year growth, right? So things like things like that, that are objective, not subject to performance measures. Um, there's a strong correlation between that self rating. Driven by this goal of separating out practices from best practices, Jeremy built a sample set of his own to do just that. He sent out his revenue maturity assessment to 122 companies. The assessment, by the way, only took about 10 to 12 minutes to fill out, and he wanted companies to be able to fill it out without having to look anything up. And of course, being the analytical guy that he is, he had some of his own internal checks and balances at Insight Partners to objectively validate the subjective answers that the companies gave about themselves. So when all of his data collection was complete, the real question is, what did he learn? Yeah, so, you know, I guess a couple things. One is I definitely if you, you obviously have a ton of listeners who are in the RevOps world. So if, if you are a RevOps leader, um, you know, again, like DM me on LinkedIn, I will send you the assessment. And this assessment actually, after you complete it within five or 10 seconds, will send you back an analysis of where you stand relative to the rest of everyone who's ever responded up to that point it's dynamic right so every new data point feeds wow. the feeds the, the the borg the brain that sits in there so it'll send that back to you it will also tell you the top five areas where you have the biggest gaps relative to those who are best practice so it actually gives you a punch list effectively of where you should concentrate uh, so there's a bunch of summary stuff in there uh, you know again we can and then we can slice and dice that further and further but at the end of the day what i'm what i was looking at was where are the biggest gaps in in perform like of the top performers minus the the lower performers where's the biggest performance gap on each one of those practices and and again correlation not causation but i would reason that where top performers are over indexing on something like whatever rules of engagement for partner channel conflict where they're over indexing on something relative to the lower performers there's something there right there's a glimmer i don't know if it's 100% you know, I can't I can't say that it's causation, right? But but there's a glimmer there, and it, it it means as a RevOps leader, you should direct your attention to that particular practice, and you may presume that it's best practice. There are some areas and we could talk about some of these where the there is no gap, or even the gap is negative, right? Like the the lower performers over index on a particular practice. Mm. To me, I I don't actually think of those as worst practice. I'm, assuming that's a term. I don't actually think of those as work worst practice. I think of them as um, at least, you know, in the context of this data set, right, with all those qualifiers, I, I think of those as it's just not something that's important as a performance differentiator, or it's not correlated with performance differentiation. So uh, that could be because everybody is already doing them. So for instance, um, on, on the comp part of the part of the assessment, most people have a 50-50 comp plan, right? Like that was one of the questions that we asked. So there is no gap between high performers and, and low performers. If we found something different, we would dig in there. But that's an example of where, yeah, you've got the the like zero difference means it's it's not 
that might still be a best practice. It's just everyone's right. doing it and there's no yeah. gap. This is important to stop and fully grasp before moving any further. What Jeremy found is that some practices are essentially foundational and don't really have an impact as a performance differentiator. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. It just might mean everyone does them and they're the status quo. While other practices, the best practices, are what actually separate the top performers from the lower performers. Jeremy mentioned that he found nine different categories of practices. And while we're not going to hit every single one in this episode, I wanted to focus on those practices where he did see a disparity in performance, in outcomes. And one big one that I know made Jeremy's list was hiring and talent management. From my own experience, this is a type of work that is incredibly hard to do well. So perhaps there's a best practice to make that work just the slightest bit easier. The number one thing that differentiates the top performers from the lower performers in, in hiring and talent management is the following um, practice that now we can presume to be best practice. Recruiting is a proactive, scalable process that ensures that roles are quickly filled. And and like the anecdote there is I, I had a, 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 a longtime friend, his name is Ralph Flamini. And he's he I met him when I worked at Gartner. We I worked there for 16 years and we overlapped for could have been, I don't know, five or ten years. And we've stayed fast friends since then. He's, you know, since worked for Oracle, um, Fortinet and and other companies. And he's an enterprise sales leader. And and I said to him, you know, we were talking about talent one day, and, and I said, like, if you had to do one thing differently, what would you, you know, or if you do one thing differently, what do you do? And he said, he throughout his career as a sales leader has has basically hired a head of attrition. So he would rather have a little excess sales capacity because he knows there's going to be some some loss, voluntary or involuntary, so that his philosophy is basically never have an open territory. That's that's like the, the that's one of the worst things you can do. So that to me is a great example of like translating this particular best practice into something super specific. And you know, we're in, we're right now in a we've shifted from growth at all costs, right. To, uh, to efficient growth, or I, I forget what Nick Meta over at, um, Gainsight calls it. Right. But, but, you know, everyone's sort of talking about efficient growth. So it's a, it's a little bit, uh, heretical to, to say you should have a little excess, excess sales capacity <laughs> right now. But, but I mean, especially where you have a very long ramp time, right? Like context matters. So in my, my friend leads enterprise sales teams that often do million dollar plus deals, it takes 12 months, realistically, right, to ramp a new hire into some of these businesses. So you, you really need to be sure that, that you don't leave these these territories open. So that, that's one. There's others in there, like our hiring plan for sellers and sales support roles ensures we have ramp capacity to meet our financial goals. So that's basically capacity planning. A lot of our RevOps peers are in, are in um, annual planning mode right now. And that that like that, how critical that is to make sure that you have these. And, and I'll say this also from kind of personal experience during my time at sales loft. Um, you know, we were, we were like worried we we're going to miss plan at one point a few years back. And the biggest, our biggest challenge was we didn't actually, we couldn't hire fast enough. We didn't have enough capacity. Um, we didn't have a good capacity plan and we hired, we hired uh, this, this uh, brilliant recruiter. Her name is Carly Jones. I mention her all the time because if I think of, single people who added some of the most value to the company companies that I've worked for. She's hands down like one of those people. And she came through and she just broke through that. You know, she aligned the capacity plan with the finance team and and sales and revenue operations. And then she built an organization that was just world class at at recruiting to make sure you meet your your capacity plans. So that that is another one. I can go on, but those are like two of the top ones where there are big gaps. The one where there isn't, and this is a good example of just kind of the flip side, right, is the lowest one where there's almost no gap is we have a programmatic approach to onboarding new talent and a documented enablement plan to help them scale up quickly. Huh. So everyone tells you like, do that, right? Like, and how do you know that? that so, so that one, I'm not saying it's not a best practice, but there's just no gap between the top performers and the low performing companies on that one. Do you think that that's because either some of those programs aren't effective or does that fall into the category we talked about earlier of like, look, you just got to do this, right? Everyone's got to do it. And so because everyone does it, there's no difference. I, I think in this case, right, the sample is, it tends to be smaller companies because, right, they're, they're, 
you know, our portfolio is distributed from whatever zero to hundreds of millions. But you know, I mean, a lot of it's concentrated in in that in kind of the the middle of that of that range. And I, I I generally think that people are not great at enablement, right? Most smaller companies kind of suck, frankly, at enablement. They may or may not have people. The enablement is is best efforts by managers or maybe somebody in product marketing, right? Is is double doing double duty as as onesie twosies of of folks are hired in. So a, a part of this, I do think, is you know, is the sample that that folks are, are, you know, I think they're generally not great at it. So it could be that if you found, if we had a few more bigger companies, you know, with much more mature enablement functions, but it might also be that, um, you know, onboarding is usually a one to three week kind of deal. And you drink from a fire hose for three weeks and, and all the academic studies out there, independent of sales training, but all the academic studies out there that say, when you just have a burst of training, that's not super effective. The retention is really low. And I, from my experience in, in the jobs I've done, but, but also in, you know, in, as I've watched account executives, I'm a fraud, by the way, I was never an AE. Um, <laughs> I, I, sold tell base- anybody. I sold, yeah, I sold baseball cards. And like when I was a kid, I sold mangoes. Like I was always hustling, but I, I never carried a B2B sales bag. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like a money ball person but ha- have never actually played <laughs> baseball. So um, anyway, yeah, I, 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 in this, in this respect I, on the, you know, on the enablement thing, people know that the, that the sort of quick burst thing doesn't work. And most of the training is, is on the job, right? Like mm. if you have a great manager who's coaching you and giving you feedback and, you know, helping you know, maybe you shadow them at first and then they, they, they step to the background and, and give you feedback either by, directly being on certain calls or, mon- or, you know, following up on your conversation, intelligence kinds of recordings and so forth, yeah. correcting you on in- entry and exit criteria on, on progression through the sales process and so forth. Like that, that on the job training, I think is far more powerful than, than her again, heretical thing, I guess to say, but I think it's far more powerful than the quick burst kind of stuff that people get in onboarding. It makes total sense that ongoing, ever-present enablement would make it into the best practice bucket. My biggest takeaway from all of Jeremy's lessons around hiring and talent management is that being proactive is a prerequisite for success. Think about it. Capacity planning, recruiting, performance management, enablement. If you're trying to fly by the seat of your pants in any of those areas, you're going to be met with outcomes that match your preparation. At this point, I am super intrigued by these small nuances that separate the practices of the top performers from the lower performers. So let's get into a truly numbers-driven category in Jeremy's maturity assessment, pipeline and forecasting. I mean, uh, no surprise here. I, I don't think this is rocket science, but the, the top two things, I'll just read, the, I'll read the, the, what appear to be best practices. So we have a large enough pipeline to achieve bookings goals in each period, given sales cycles and win rates. Um, you know, that's is that cause or effect? You could argue both ways, but it, but the if you think about that, it's it's like maniacal dedication to to pipeline, and then I think the second one is the one that is the input to the first one, which is we monitor and report on pipeline created per seller on a frequent, for example, weekly basis. And you know, if I if I look at there's one of the one of the cool things about this this new job I have is you know I get to look across. We have 500 portfolio companies, so I get to look across tremendous uh, amount of data and and company performance. And the 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 number one kind of success slash failure factor is is this one, from what I can tell. It's basically, um, am I am am I from leadership down to first line managers holding reps accountable to pipeline production? And it it. it Somebody had a counter argument with, you know, on this, which is, okay, if you just demand more pipeline, what do you get? You get a bunch of crappy opportunities. So yes, you need to control for that, right? I think it is the pairing of, of making sure that pipeline gets created, but then also inspecting that pipeline to make sure that it's, it's quality and qualified, you know, pipeline meeting the exit criteria, meeting the the standards of your persona and ICP and, and all that. But uh, as I said to the person that I was talking to, it's like, if you don't knock on the door, you're not going to sell any Girl Scout cookies, right? So you got to at least, you got to knock on the door, right? So, and, and, and the door knock here is, is making sure that opportunities get injected into the top of the pipeline. 
so the the ops person in me can't help but like want to open up that a little bit more and, and, and dig in a little bit deeper. So I've probably spent more time in a room arguing about pipeline attribution and who sourced this and whose job it like than I would care to admit, right? Like just too met too much time uh, over the years. And so I'm curious, like completely agree with mm -hmm. with both of those statements and the fact that one leads to the other. In that maniacal focus about that pipeline created per seller, did you find or learn anything or, or from anecdotal from within the portfolio company about, you know, what does that look like for new business versus existing customers? Or what does that look like for a rep versus their SDR or a marketing support? Like that's where I feel like the rubber hits yeah. the road. And that's also where like, again, you can get stuck in like finger pointing or you can say, look, we're all responsible here. And so I'm just curious what you found. I love that. And there's so much to unpack. And if, if people, if we were, you know, video cast or whatever these, whatever it would be called, they'd, they'd see me smiling. And I'm smiling because um, one thing absolutely that I've seen a, a successful, unsuccessful companies is that they are separating their new logo and their expansion pipeline. Uh, that's an absolute uh, you know, I, I will say it anecdotally, right? I'll say it with conviction, but it's an absolute best practice. And um, I see far too many companies who aggregate the pipeline. Almost everybody does. In fact, it's rare to see that separated. It's very rare to see that there to be separate targets, sometimes for the entire company, like they just mm -hmm. don't think that way. And, um, and then certainly down to the, you know, manager or rep level, that's very rare to see the separation and and it's not even that the, you have to give the rep necessarily that explicit target, although there's there are some benefits to to doing that. Um, but but to at least know what what your targets are. And the reason this becomes a problem is the following, right? I'll, I'll see a portfolio company that has whatever 140 percent NRR, right? They're just raging net retention growth, and and like that's and, and that's masking the fact that they're not acquiring enough new logos. But the problem with even 140 percent NRR is that that's cohort based. And as companies mature as customers, right, when they're in their third, fourth, fifth year, they're probably no longer growing at, you know, some extreme rate. And if you don't acquire enough new logos, then you start, you hit a growth problem and you start mm -hmm. to miss. And then it's, it takes a long time, right? Like to, to, to recharge the new logo thing when everybody's focused on, you know, reps in most cases will naturally focus on, on expansion. There are some company cultures and even like uh country cultures where the the you know the culture is like whatever chess banging over acquiring new logos and there's a pride in in doing that but mostly you go you, you go you know fish where it's easy to fish sure Probably so best. yeah that's one thing i would unpack I, I think the other best you know like sub best practice that is is within what you were saying was the best companies this relates to attribution. The best companies are extremely thoughtful about source about sourcing pipeline. And I'm going to distinguish sourcing pipeline from attribution. Right? It's like they have a waterfall that they say, you know, for for each for you know a given rep in a given segment, I know that a certain percent is going to be whatever product generated. I know a certain percent is going to be, you know, demo request inbound driven by demand gen via paid sources. I know a certain percent is going to percent's gonna be outbound. I know a certain percent is going to be CSQLs, like whatever, right? Whatever the sources are, they have a they have a you know targets, waterfall target effectively to build up where where those leads will become generated, you, you know. By I separate this from attribution simply because I, I you know I ran an attribution as a CMO and I ran an attribution as a head of RevOps and it's it's basically impossible, right? Like. <laughs> I think you just choose something. You choose either first touch or last touch. Um, I don't. I, I kind of like first touch a little better, but you could probably argue me into the other one. What I did try to do because I'm a, a you know big effing propeller head is I once tried to build you know like a statistical model using logistic regression, you know, to separate all the factors uh, in, in attribution, and that was before there were tools. Right to do that, mm -hmm. but even those tools, the data it's the data is just not good enough yeah. to to do proper attribution. And I also just think nothing good comes of it. It's like mm 
I, I learned, you know, I learned a good lesson from one of my bosses. He's uh, when I had, I'd done a, I'd done a, like a massive retention analysis to figure out what factors drove retention for the company so we could prioritize our effort. And then he's this, this, this dude, um, uh, he, he's one of the smartest people, if not the smartest person I've ever met. He did the work that led his professor to win the Nobel prize in Bose Einstein condensates, MIT physics, PhD, like just well, ra- ragingly brilliant. And he sort of sat back in his chair and he said, you didn't need to do all that work because we have enough capacity in customer success to touch every customer, you know, with whatever, whatever was needed. So there was no need to actually prioritize the accounts. So anyway, this is my point of going back to attribution. It's, it's like, even if you were able to do it, it probably is not on, it's probably unnecessary, but definitely the waterfall contribution of pipeline by source is incredibly important because that yeah. helps you with budgeting and focus. I particularly appreciate when I talk to people like Jeremy who have both been there, done that as operators, and they're also just plain realistic when it comes to the application of theory to practice in a business. People like this and people not like this are instantly recognizable. Jeremy is trying to teach us. The best practice is we monitor and report on pipeline created per seller on a frequent basis. But how you break that best practice down, how you think about what contributes to that monitoring and that frequency, those are going to be imperfect. You can solve for that imperfection, however, by breaking the pipeline problem down into pieces that you can understand and then go after them. Which brings us to one final category from Jeremy's best practices survey that I wanted to explore, sales process. And Jeremy told me that there's a natural bridge between our pipeline and forecasting best practices and those around sales processes and operating rhythms. Yeah, there's a great actually bridge between this pipeline and forecast category and the sales process. And and the bridge is there's a question that could have fit in either one of them. And I wasn't exactly sure where to put it. So, um, but it's, I put it in one, in one category, but it's, we have an operating rhythm in place to help advance deals this period and next period that engages all levels of sales leadership. I'm a student of CROs and I, and I try to figure out, okay, what is the play that I've seen CROs when they come into companies run most often? And, um, this is the, this is like the, one of the plays that I have seen consistently, which is they come in and usually there's very poor deal inspection, right? Usually there's very poor, like looking at the forecast performance QBRs, right? They come in and they put all that in place and that, you know, that accelerates business. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. So like that one totally makes sense to me. In the sales process category, the number one biggest gap area, we can come back to that kind of operating rhythm. Um, But the number one thing is we follow a data-driven approach to optimizing our sales process that considers activity, effectiveness, and results. And I think all these things are, are tied together a bit, right? Is, you know, you've got that operating rhythm, but then you're also ensuring tying back to our waterfall of, of source, um, for pipeline build, right. Is like, who is it? Uh, Jason Jordan and Michelle Vazana, uh, cracking the sales management code. Definitely one of my favorite. It's one of my two favorite sales management books. The other one is, uh, actually my favorite favorite is a uh, sales manager survival guide by, I think David Brock wrote that one. That's, that's, it's a little academic, but anyway, uh, getting back to Jason and Michelle, the, they're all about activity, right? They're all about activity because, you know, if you just say more pipeline, that, that doesn't help. If you just say more, worse yet is like more wins that doesn't help, right? It's, it's doing the right activity effectively that, that matters. And those things can be measured. So I'll give you an anecdote when I was at at sales loft and I'm trying to say, not say that too often, right? It it get repetitive. It's, (laughs) uh, but, but the, you know, that was the company did well. So I guess some of those things are or hopefully your best practice. Good role model. I, I was running the uh, first job I had there was running the sales development team and we had about 60 SDRs, so good amount of data. And I did this chart and it was a two by two and on one axis was activity and on the other axis was a me- measure of of um was effectiveness. What it was was the number of activities per op generated. And mm-hmm. I plotted each rep each month on that so I could sort of see the distribution. And, you know, the ideal is you got a person with high activity and what you want is low activities per op. That means they're super effective. 
So our most effective SDRs would would be like between 80 and 100 activities per op. It doesn't mean you're hitting one person, right? Yeah. 80 times. It means you're hitting 10 people eight times, right? Yeah. So so those those were were our top performers. And then newbies like, you know, they could easily be doing 300 or 400 activities per op when they were brand new. Um because they right, they just kind of yeah. didn't have the rhythm. And in the early days we we weren't as disciplined, you know, at at centralizing the messaging that was being used and and so forth. Um so and 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 how we directed people to personalize and what offers they they provided, right? So you know, we we tune that up over time. But anyway, that that activity effectiveness, activity and effectiveness drives results thing. No surprise to me that that popped out as the number one sales process discipline. And I'm glad you gave that example on the effectiveness front because I was going to ask something similar. And and we actually do something very similar to that at Drift when we think about when we launch new sales plays, right? Or or the either you know the sequences or the messaging that goes with that, right? And basically measuring same thing like the number of touch points to yield um, and being able to say, oh my gosh, like this this new play, it's you know, 10 touches instead of 80, like, holy cow, like we need to like continue to use this. And then, you know, that will wane over time. But I'm curious, like when, when you think about that entire bucket of effectiveness, if I take a step back, is that basically conversion rates? Is that how I should think about effectiveness as kind of like the best gauge there? Or are there other ways you think about effectiveness? I mean, effectiveness to me is, 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 the mathematical equation that bridges activity and results, right? So, so I, I, it could be, you know, it could be a, a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, it, it is the conversion of, of, uh, yeah, it is the conversion of activity to results. And, and how do you, to me, where I, where I thought you were going to go was like, how do you juice effectiveness? Right. Mm. And, you know, it gets back to our enablement conversation earlier. It's like consistent feedback, for, you know, from, from an expert, from the manager. Um, it also is, you know, it can be affected by things that are out of the reps control, right? Product, brand. One of the, another thing that I've done in the past um, is, I forget if I, who I, I think I stole this from Drift, actually. Funny enough, you guys used to have a, and maybe you still do, you had like a, a inbound response benchmark or some kind of benchmark thing sure. that you, yeah. that you guys, like was that what it was? type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys had this awesome benchmark. It was probably, you probably created it years back, I, I, I bet. So I stole that idea and, and I said, okay, well, what are some things that we could do to basically give value when we're prospecting that are not giving away the product, right? And uh, this is PPL, pre-PLG days, right? But what are some things that, that you could do? And, you know, we created things like a, a, a find business email, you know, website or little little applet or whatever website mm-hmm. i guess a, a cadence builder um uh, it, an email subject line grader right like all these kind of grader types of things i, I stole partly from drift i stole partly from hubspot i guess we had you know they because they had a I'm sure awesome marketing grader yeah <laughs> um everyone stole from them right yeah. like uh so anyway so that way when when people are prospecting they can they can truly give value and not just whatever, hey, I was intrigued by your profile on LinkedIn, you know, blah, 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 blah. Do you want a meeting, right? It's how, how do you actually add value during that sequence of uh, sequence slash cadence, depending on your your word of choice um, of, of touches. And, and obviously, you're an incredibly data-driven person, right? And so this, this kind of best practice of, you know, having a data-driven sales team, that uses, you know, activity, effectiveness and results as your kind of core competencies, like suits you very well. I'm curious, like, is there a version of that that becomes like a little bit a bridge too far within some of these companies where you're finding it to be the best practice? Because what what I get nervous about is like, okay, now you're going to have slice and dice this 17 different ways where like this effect activity or this effectiveness and then all of a sudden like you're so far gone that you yeah. can't actually find the main thing um which you know i think comes back to just the focus or the question you're trying to answer but like is there a world inside of this best practices where it's like okay you have to measure this stuff but you also need to be incredibly deliberate about what you choose to measure yeah i'll go in i'll go in like with two 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 tracks of answers. One is, is there is a world, right, where 
you need extreme data. And the PLG world, I think, fits that category because you need to think about, right, unique qualified visitors, conversion rates, you know, blah, 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 retention of free users, you know, and so on. Like that world is becoming more data driven even than the stuff that we've been talking about. At the other end of the spectrum, I was I was down at one of our portfolio companies in DC and they sell into the, you know, the military and federal civilian space. Their minimum contract is like a million dollars and they, you know, they'll do a ten million dollar, they'll do ten million dollar contracts. Mm. And, you know, those ten million dollar contracts might last five or ten years, right? So in that case, there just isn't enough it's not. It's not a volume business, right? It's not a PL. You don't sell a ten million dollar um, deal to the army f- um, with activity, right? Like it just doesn't work that way. So, so uh, there's those there's those two ends of um, you know there's the two ends of those those spectrums. The other thing that I was thinking about when you were saying that was it just sort of made me think about the you know Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown, right? There's pictures of the control room and there's like tons and tons of of lights and switches and knobs and whatever. And there was like one, one light in one part that was telling what the problem was, but it was, you know, either misinterpreted or, uh, yeah, it was ultimately found, but then misinterpreted. Right. So I, I have talked to this sort of next generation of startups who are working on, on like, you know, we had this first wave of analytics, which is I'm going to put everything in Looker or Tableau or whatever, right? Like I'm going to put stuff in there, and that stuff is still incredibly valuable. Um, but there's a, there, and then you know, there's a new wave of people who, or the second wave, I guess, of people who would say, okay, we know in sales that there are this set of KPIs, this set of metrics, especially in SaaS, for example. Like there's this set of metrics that that matter, and they're generally like you know, common. There's whatever of them. I mean, they're in the tens, if not, you know, maybe order of magnitude 100, but not extreme. But it's still too much to look at and too much to monitor. And once you start to slice that by month, by quarter, by rep, by this, by that, it becomes too much. The third wave that I've been seeing now is, okay, we know there's all these these metrics. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically hide all that from you. And I'm just going to proactively alert you when something is out of range. And um, I think that's that that to me is the answer is is this third wave where, you know, you kind of load it with, well, I guess what what they would love to do is you just load it with um, you just connect it to your your system, basically. Yeah. Right. Tell and then the almost like almost like credit card fraud, because the technology has existed for a long time. It just sort of tells you when things are out of line and alerts you that, hey, you know, possible fraud detected, but fraud detected is not fraud. It's it's like ops are out of whack uh, or pipelines out of whack yeah. for this rep in this region, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I, I think that that's the answer because, yeah, it doesn't take much on a dashboard to completely overwhelm even an analytical person. Humans just can't process that that volume and variety of information. So you don't know where to look. But the thing is, is the signal is there, right? It, it's de- it, But it, it, it just needs to be detected and brought to the front. Before we go, at the end of each show, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months? The Jolt. Oh, yeah, I can go this right away. I read I read like a book a week. Um, sales wow. book, The Jolt The Jolt Effect, which was just released. Matt Dixon and the, the Challenger people, really solid. The takeaway there is um, sales, sales kind of has two phases. First phase is, is creating value, and the second phase is reducing perceived risk. Mm. All right. I'll have to add that one to the list. Uh, Favorite part about working in ops? Definitely the math, the intellectual problem solving and challenge. Flip side, least favorite part about working in ops? Um, Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a slightly different answer, which is I loved working in ops because I loved the, um, like the complexity of the implementation that you might come up with an idea. And when you actually went to implement it, you know, that's where the, you know, what hits the road and dealing with the change management and people stuff. Yeah. I will say, I'm going to tweak your question, which is that's the thing I miss the most in the job I'm doing now, right? Is like, I'm, I provide a lot of advice, but I don't get to, to deal with the, that, that, um, co- that challenge, that intellectual challenge of actually implement, of implementing something. That's super interesting. You, you, you miss the hard stuff. 
I miss, yeah, I miss the heart. I miss the people challenge and behavioral, yeah. you know, it's like a version of behavioral economics on how do you make this stuff happen? It's a huge, huge part of the job. Um, someone who impacted you getting to the job you have today. Oh, wow. Every manager I ever had. Um, but most, most importantly, yeah, I, I would say, a um, a manager um, that I had a Gartner, his name was Nir Polanski. So I was a I was an analyst at Gartner for about eight years, and then I moved into the central strategy part of the organization. And um, I had this. He was a former McKinsey consultant, and he was giving me so much feedback. I had never had a boss who gave me so much feedback, and I actually got mad at him in the first week. I'm like, just let me do my job. And I had a wake up call. He's like, Hey, I should have explained what I'm doing, which is if I teach you everything I know, then I near become expendable, which means I near can get promoted and you can too. So, you know, young Padawan, please, it's time to listen to me. And I said, uh, you know, yes, yes, Jedi master, I will now listen to you. That's phenomenal advice. Um, and very, very true. All right. Now your turn. One piece of advice from you for people who want to have your job someday. Be a, uh, you know, be a sales nerd. I, I think, right. I, I, I'm it's up to people to judge this, but I may or may not come off as a, you know, someone who has a depth of knowledge in in revenue operations. I'm I'm nearing 50 and I did not do this for 30 years. Like I've been doing this for I don't know, 8 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I but I've read like every imaginable book. I read them to this day. I I listen to like podcasts galore. I talk to people peers, colleagues all the time. So it's just be an incredible sales nerd. If, if you want my job, you can have it. Thanks so much to Jeremy for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. If you liked what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to our show. A new episode comes out every other Friday. Also, if you learned something from Jeremy or from any of our episodes, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. Six star reviews only. All right, that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.